Hello, everybody, and welcome to Letterform Lectures 2023. Letterform Lectures are co-presented by the Letterform Archive and the SFPL Book Arts and Special Collections. Letterform Archive is a nonprofit institution housing over 100,000 works of graphic design history. We'd like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring the video recording of this lecture series. You can view all Letterform lectures online soon after they happen. Just check our website, letterformarchive.org. Here's the main event. Johanna Drucker is the Breslauer Professor of Bibliographical Studies at UCLA. Sounds pretty prestigious. Um, she is internationally known for her work in the history of graphic design, typography, experimental poetry, fine art, and digital humanities. In addition to her many academic contributions, she also produces artist books. And her artwork is represented in special collections, museums, and libraries in North American and Europe, and has been exhibited widely. Here's a story. In 1978, she was traveling and she went to Amsterdam where there was an institution called the Druk Haus, a letter press workshop where you could rent the equipment. And when she arrived there, the gentleman who supervised the shop uh, was one of those um, demanding trolls who lives under the bridge. Um, anyway, she asked if she could print and he told her that they didn't teach people to print there. And he gave her a dismissive shrug. No problem, she said, I know how to print. He looked dubious. She was young, she was a girl, she was an American. You must bring me something you have printed so I can see, he said. And what's your name? My name, she said, is Johanna Drucker, giving it the Dutch pronunciation. Johanna the printer. He then broke into laughter and said, you don't have to bring me anything. You're good to go. <laughs> All right. So without further ado, let's welcome Johanna the printer. Thank you so much, Grendel. Thank you to the Letterform Archive for inviting me to do this talk. It's, you know, amazing to see what's at the Letterform Archive and the amazing treasures and collections that are here. Um, it's a real uh, rare and special place. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight about my uh, book, Inventing the Alphabet. And um, before I plunge into a lot of detail about that book, um, which is right here, The Origins of Letters from Antiquity to the Present, I want to kind of put in place what this book is not about, as well as what the book is about. So The Origins of Letters from Antiquity to the Present sounds like it's about the development and um, evolution of the alphabet as a script. But Basically, it's not. It's a historiography. It's a, really a book about how did we come to know what we know about the origins of the alphabet. So that's kind of a meta project, which is very different from a project like this. So for those who are interested in actually knowing the history of the alphabet, how it emerged and how it came to consolidate before it spread, a work like this by Joseph Neva, the late and very um, esteemed Western Semitic epigrapher, is a very useful reference to know. This book was published in 1989. Now, um, I, as I said, I, I want to talk about what my book is not about to begin with, um, because there are so many uh, misperceptions about the alphabet. And those prevail. So if I were to, if I ask, you know, my like poet friends or you know some of my colleagues who work in you know literature, information, whatever, if I say you know, something about the alphabet, they look at me and they mean they say, "Oh, you mean our alphabet, the Greek alphabet, which alphabet?" So all those questions are based on misunderstandings. There's actually only one source for the alphabet. It's a proto-Canaanite taproot that emerges around 1700 BCE. I'll show you where and when. And the Greek alphabet is a late development, comes into being sometime around the eighth century BCE, so almost a thousand years later. And our alphabet is actually based on Roman letter forms, not on the Greek, alpha, 
Greek forms. But the point is that all of these things have one single point of origin, and that is in the ancient Near East. Now, we're familiar with the letters. We, we, we know them, we recognize them, we're, you know, we're schooled in them from the time that we're children, but we don't always know where they came from. And again, that's part of this little prelude here. What is the actual history of the alphabet's emergence and evolution? So we see these forms, these little, you know, child's, you know, exercise forms. And then we see this. And again, this is kind of familiar. You know, we were used to seeing this little A over here that looks kind of like an ox head, Aleph, and the bath, and the, oh, these are Hebrew names. Oh, for the letters. And oh, what does this look like? And Heth is a gate and so forth. But if you look below the image, you will see that this alphabet is attributed to the Phoenicians. Now, the Phoenicians, the term is anachronistic. The Phoenicians themselves never called themselves the Phoenicians. They were a coastal people and they identified um, themselves according to their towns. So they're, they're in, in Tyre, in Sidon and so forth. They're Sidonians, Tyronians. Um, and that's important because the concept of the Phoenicians is something that comes into play within this alphabet historiography. But anyway, this kind of a chart um, shows an alphabet that we gets attributed to the Phoenicians. And the reason for that is because they are the people who spread the alphabet around the Mediterranean. They are sailors, they are traders, they are intrepid people of the boat, right? And uh, we'll see exactly where that where they go um, in just a second. So this is the um, Fertile Crescent. This is the area in which human civilization emerged into cities, into agriculture, um, where hard grains were first cultivated. So it's a very important area for all of human culture. It's, you know, um, uh, it is the kind of formation of uh, whole sets of, of, you know, modern human um, behavior patterns and social patterns. And it was occupied initially by the Sumerians who came in here at the Lower Sea in the Persian Gulf. And the Sumerians had kind of pictographic cuneiform language. In other words, they used clay and they made pictographs, um, but they spoke a language that's never been fully deciphered. And it's not even clear where the Sumerians came from. Um, they were dark haired. They had, you know, sort of a whole kind of their language is not related to other um, languages that are well known. But in this whole area here of the Tigris, um, Tigris and Euphrates River valleys, um, it, it, advanced cultures start to develop. And I call them advanced only in the sense that this is where cities, storage, uh, food surplus and administrative systems um, emerged for the first time that we know of in human culture. And that's sometime about 10,000 years ago, about 8,000 BCE. So in this area, the cuneiform uh, script um, emerges with its languages of Assyrian and uh, Babylonian and so forth. And all of the languages in this region, in this fertile crescent, are part of a large Afro-Asiatic language group. And so the um, that means that in North Africa here, the African side of the Afro-Asiatic group prevails. But throughout this coastal region and around into the Tigris and Euphrates River uh, valleys, because um, this Arabia is like mainly desert. Okay, so throughout that region, um, the Semitic language groups of the Afro-Asiatic languages prevail. So these groups are united um, culturally and linguistically. And what we're going to see is that the alphabet is going to emerge in a relationship between cuneiform script to the north and hieroglyphics that emerge in Egypt to the south. Hieroglyphics emerge around 2700 BCE. They don't seem to have a kind of um, you know, like baby step stage. They just kind of like really the Narmer palette, you know, is suddenly this um, artifact with fully developed hieroglyphics on it. Now, hieroglyphics are complicated in terms of how they represent language um, and ideas. 
Cuneiform initially is used as Denise Mont Besserat's work shows to represent quantities and entities to be an accounting device, um, first with tokens and then with tablets. Um, and then that, again, that's about, you know, seven, 6,000 BCE. By 2700 BCE, Cuneiform has become a script that represents language. So that's important, and the same is to some extent true for hieroglyphics. But it represents language as ideas, as thoughts, as words, and so forth. But what happens with the alphabet is that the alphabet emerges here in Canaan. And what distinguishes the alphabet, and this is really crucial, is that the alphabet is based on the analysis of the sounds of the Semitic language. So think about this. Okay, think about this for a minute, all right? You have a native language, right? You have a language that you speak all the time that you're familiar with. If I said to you, I'm gonna put you in a room, I'm gonna ask you to figure out what are the basic sounds that are distinct in your language. And when you finish figuring that out, I'll let you out. How long do you think you'd be in that room? So the fact that the alphabet is based on the analysis of the significant sounds of the Semitic language, these Semitic languages, is an incredible intellectual leap. And it allows the alphabet to be a very small set of signs. It's actually 17, 18 signs when it emerges here and to be incredibly efficient and adaptable. Other signs can be added if there's a sound that's not in the Semitic language. That's what happens with the Greeks. Anyway, so this is the site of emergence. That is the distinctive feature of the alphabet, but it's made in a cultural exchange between the cuneiform scripts to the north and the hieroglyphic forms to the south. And exactly where and when and how that evolution takes place is what people like Joseph Neva look, like, look at in great detail. Once the alphabet is consolidated and becomes a kind of stable set of signs, as we saw in that slide after the little ABCs, and we see that Phoenician script, once it becomes stabilized, you see, here's Biblos, one of the um, uh, cities on the coast of the Levant that later gets called Phoenician, Biblos, Tyre, Sidon are the major cities. Once it's established, it spreads. And one of the places it spreads it's into Greece, it goes by land, it goes by sea. Um, now, the Greeks had been literate before this. There was a Mycenaean civilization in Crete and in Greece, uh, linear A, linear B, a Cypriot syllabary. Cyprus is a really crucial um, uh, sort of uh, location in the trade routes. So there had been a Mycenaean civilization that was literate. But by sometime around, you know, 1300, 1200 BCE, there was a, you know, sort of end of the Bronze Age civilizations there. There's a Dark Ages. Literacy disappears. So there's a period of about 400 years in which there is not a literate culture in Greece. And when the alphabet arrives again into the, well, when it arrives into the Greek islands, because these scripts that were down here on um, Crete and in the, you know, uh, southern part of Greece were not alphabetic. Again, they were syllabaries and, and uh, hieroglyphic, you know, uh, pic uh, pictographic systems. The alphabet arrives again, and it's as though there has, is no memory of literacy. But the alphabet doesn't only spread to Greece and Asia Minor, the whole coast of Turkey is incredibly important. This area up in, you know, along the edge of the Mediterranean, modern day Syria, the Sinai, North Africa, these are all areas that are, you know, part of trade routes where the alphabet spreads. Just to put this again into another perspective, and then I'm going to shift gears and look at what my book is really focused on, though all of this knowledge shows up in the figures that I deal with um, in, the, in the book. But just to put this into a kind of tree structure to give you a sense of how the alphabet as a single taproot proliferates and specializes, here's a chart. Notice the timeline on the bottom. So sometime around 1700, 1600, Proto-Canaanite, the taproot consolidates. 
By consolidates, I mean, it takes a form that does not deviate and modifies, but doesn't deviate. The sequence of the letters, the names of the letters, and the sounds assigned to them remain stable. And that is true through all of these modifications. Now, letters will be added here and there. The Greeks had a few letters because they need vowels to be explicit. Um, you know, uh, Armenians add a few letters. Uh, you know, Old English has a thorn and a yod. And, you know, stuff gets added to make the, the relationship between the letters and the sounds more accurate. But essentially what you see here is here's proto-Canaanite, the taproot. It goes down into South Semitic, so it goes down into the old sort of Ethiopic, um, you know, domain. We see Ancient Greek, which becomes, you know, Roman, Etruscan, Coptic, which is Egyptian, Armenian, modern Greek, all these things. But look at the dates on this. This is happening in the Common Era, right? We're already into the Common Era when these things are happening. Arabic occurs only a couple hundred years before the common era, as does new Hebrew. Old Hebrew, and we'll touch on that in a second, Paleo-Hebrew emerges, but this is actually an inaccurate aspect of this chart because Paleo-Hebrew is back here with Proto-Canaanite um, and then Samaritan on which we will touch again. So the point here is, oh, and also look at this, all of the scripts of the Indian subcontinent. And this becomes more clear when you look at this chart, look at this. So this is kind of mind boggling. We have the Canaanite proto, you know, the proto Canaanite, proto Sinatic, this slightly different nomenclatures, different set of politics here. But if you look at this, we got our South Arabic scripts, Ethiopic, Amharic, we get Aramaic becoming Imperial Aramaic. Look at this Syriac, Nabataean becomes Arabic, Persian, Turkish, modern Persian. Jewish becomes modern Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew is another story, archaic Hebrew, and it, you know, sort of um, dies out. It's up way up here, old Hebrew. All right. But when you realize that all the Indian scripts of the South Asian Peninsula are derived from this, uh, you know, it's, it's mind boggling. In use today, in our current world, you are either seeing alphabetic scripts or character-based scripts. And this little map will make that clear. The only things that are not alphabet, 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 alphabet are Chinese script, Japanese script, and Korean is a complicated case. But look at that, right? That's that's China and, and that's Japan. And the rest is, you know, Roman, Latin, Arabic, and many of these things mix. So it's either an alphabet or it's character-based. There are really no other scripts in use today except in very specialized communities. Okay, I've just tried to fill in for you a little bit of basic information about the alphabet in order to set the stage for what my book is actually about. Now, I'm gonna move through a number of different technologies and um, sort of, uh, think about the way in which the technologies of knowledge production and transmission play a role in our concept of what constitutes the alphabet, its origin, and its identity. So it's kind of a meta argument in that regard. So to do that, and again, I'm going to move fairly quickly through this just to give you a sense of the scope of this project, because it started 40 years ago. It started when I went into Doe Library as a new graduate student and was interested in writing, you know, visual writing, history of writing. And I come across this. Now, maybe this is totally legible to you. I mean, like maybe you just like know immediately that Franciscus Mercurius von Helmont, son of an alchemist, you know, friend of Leibniz is doing something totally rational and sensible in 1667 with his alphabeti veri naturalis. What did I know? I open this up. These are engraved plates. I look at this thing. I'm like, what? What am I looking at, right? What is this? You know, why is this guy's head sliced open? Why is he wearing this crown with weird letters on it? What are those numbers doing under the letter forms? What are these things down below? 
1667 is a period when there's all this philosophical language stuff going on. Is there a natural language? And Van Helmont has this idea that, yes, there's a natural language, and it's derived from the organs of pronunciation, the organs of speech. Oh, sure. Once you know that, it's totally clear what's going on in this picture, right? No problem. Take a look. What's happening? Oh, yeah, the tongue, the glottis, the, 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 the upper part of the esophagus. Yeah, of course, that's where Aleph comes from. Wait a minute. Really? And this is, of course, where Beth comes from. Okay. So when you pronounce the letter, what's happening in your mouth is what makes the letter form as a visual form. Okay. And these Paleo Hebrew speakers somehow got that, or were they slicing open their friends and watching them talk like hello? So, but then, like, even given how weird that is, right? Then what's this thing? Number three in both cases, it's got these ringlets at the end of it. These are called ring letters. And these are letters that are supposedly of celestial origin. They are taken from uh, observing the constellations. You can see the resemblance between Aleph as a, a brush letter and Aleph as a ring letter. But then what's number four? What are we doing with number four? Where'd that thing come from? So this raised all kinds of questions in my mind that took me 40 years to answer. Where did these letter forms come from? What is Van Helmont doing with them? Why are they there? What were his sources in 1667 for finding these forms? Because it's going to turn out that the number fours here are Paleo-Hebrew. What are the sources for Paleo-Hebrew? Once you ask a question like that, what are the sources? You're in the middle level. You're asking, what are the means of knowledge transmission, and how are they informing and understanding? So to track down some of these um, things, I turned, I found another amazing book, which is Edmund Fry's Pantographia. Oh, sorry, there's a typo in the, in the um, caption down here. It should be Pantographia from 1799. Now, 1799 is a really interesting moment, just like 1667 for Van Helmont, very interesting, founding of the academies, it's a kind of codification of professional knowledge, blah, 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 blah. Edmund Fry, sitting in London, he is a printer, he's a punch cutter. He decides he wants to make a compendium. Look at this title accurate copies of all the known alphabets in the world, all the known alphabets in the world, right? And go on, you know, English explanation of the force or power, that's the sound of each letter, et cetera, et cetera. 1799 is an interesting moment. It's a very important moment for English colonial expansion. So there's a purpose for Fry's, you know, interest in these different scripts, but Fry's a punch cutter. He is going to cut punches and make specimens of 300 or so different scripts. Okay, it takes him six years. It doesn't seem that long. But also, Fry is very, very good about giving us all of his sources. So here we're going to see a script he calls Chaldean. Chaldean? What's Chaldean? Where's Chaldea? I'm sure you remember that Chaldea is the land from which Abraham went when he moved to Canaan. So it's the original homeland. Chaldea is actually in the Tigris Euphrates Valley. But the point is that Fry decides that what he's going to do is to reference all of his sources. So you see here, Duray, page 127. Okay, who's Duray? Writing in 1799, again, at the peak of, of a kind of a colonial expansion, it's not the peak, but at this moment of incredible colonial expansion, making these specimens, thinking about the global stretch of, of, of England's influence. Fry is also sitting on the cusp between biblical timelines as an explanation of history and modern geological timelines, deep time as an explanation of history. James Hutton, Lyle, these figures who are looking at geography are going to break open the historical, you know, sort of the understanding of the historical past. 
So everything that Fry's collecting in 1799 makes a snapshot of the understanding of history in this period, because Fry's got no modern history in his citations. So that's also really, really interesting because starting in the early 19th century, the world's gonna change in terms of alphabet history. So let's look again at Fry. So we have these Chaldeans, Chaldeans, they're from the ancient Near East. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details here, except to say that this letter form, come back to this in just a second, is supposedly the same that Seth, remember Seth, son of Adam, engraved upon the two columns, you're supposed to know what they are, mentioned in chapter four of the first book of Josephus. Josephus, you remember Josephus, the first century Jewish Roman historian. So these are references that are in common play in the period in which Fry is writing and in which Duray was writing. Chaldean number three, another of the scripts that Fry collected. Now, a lot of Fry scripts are perfectly straightforward, Greeks and Armenian and Cyrillic and so forth. But it was the Chaldeans that fascinated me because I wondered, what was their source? Where'd they come from? What do they tell us about alphabet historiography? So Chaldean number three, as you see here, is also said to have been used by Adam. Now this is gonna make a mess in a minute because how could Adam have the alphabet when, as we know, it's Moses who goes up on Mount Sinai, brings down the tablets. The Decalogue contains every letter of the alphabet. Supposedly, that's a moment when God is giving writing to Moses. Oh, man, this is a mess, right? But so here we are. Uh, notice the sources here, Spahat Dissert, page 80, and Dr. Morton's tables. I decided I was going to track every single reference in Fry, and I did. But I will tell you, it took me a long time. What is Spanheim Dissert? And well, it turns out to be Dissertatio of Spanheim. And Dr. Morton, do you know how many Dr. Mortons there are in English like reference sources? So figuring this out took a whole mess of time. But let's take a look at these forms. If you were paying attention a few minutes ago, you will notice that this A, this weird F looking A was showing up in the crown of uh, Van Helmont's uh, slice up uh, specimen and this strange B, because guess what? There they are, the F, the B, F, it's not an F, it's an Aleph, the B, the bat is here. These are Paleo-Hebrew. These are actually Paleo-Hebrew forms. These are some of the earliest forms that the alphabetic letters take. So Fry is getting these from Duray. He's getting them from Morton. He's getting them from Spanheim. Where are they getting them from? What is the history of transmission of these forms? Big question. Okay, enough introduction. And um, I'm going to move now into a few short kind of vignettes to address the issue of forms of knowledge transmission in alphabet historiography. So just touching on each of these, because if Fry could absorb all of this information, reproduce these images across this long lineage, you know, what lies behind that? The earliest text that we have that says anything about the alphabet and its origins, and we have alphabet evidence now much older, but the earliest text is that of Herodotus, 440 BCE. Now, this is Nestor's cup from the 8th century BCE, but Herodotus in 440 BCE describes the arrival of the alphabet into Greece from the East. Now, this kind of a, a inscription, which you see is fairly um, well-developed, but still has some of the features of the Paleo-Hebrew and phonetic that we saw earlier, um, is going to be inventoried again in mid-century. Uh, every piece of the archaic Greek inscriptions gets inventoried by a fantastic scholar named Lillian Jeffrey. Jeffrey will cite Herodotus in order to authenticate her theses and her findings, because she's interested in how to correlate Herodotus's account with the physical evidence that has come to light in you know, the last several hundred years at that point. 
So Herodotus says Cadmus brought us the alphabet into Greece and Cadmus came from the East and um, the Phoenician alphabet, he doesn't call it Phoenician, but the alphabet that Cadmus brings doesn't work for the Greek language. We had to add a few letters. We needed vowels to be explicit. Palamedes gave us a few letters and so did somebody else. So Herodotus is clear on this. Herodotus text is transmitted across, you know, basically 2,400 years. It still shows up, but it's a text. It's a stable text, it's, you know, regularly cited without too much corruption, but it's a text. What Herodotus doesn't do in the fourth century and can't really do is to instantiate what he's seeing in an image. We do not know what script he actually was looking at. And that's why looking at these early things through the eyes of Lillian Jeffrey, the archaic scripts of ancient Greece is so important because she's trying to figure out what Herodotus was looking at. What were the letter forms? So a text can do certain things, but it does not instantiate the exemplars. Now this is crucial. And the study of the, you know, again, the, all of the forms of letters that circulated around Greece in the period of its dissemination through Phoenician traders, again, Phoenician traders, um, is an object of incredible study and, and fascination. But you can see that there are variants in these letter forms. And is that because they're local? Is that because the scribe wasn't skilled? Is that because, you know, what? So all this is evidence to be sorted out, but that's this is a 20th century image. Another text that is crucial is the text in Genesis, right? Hebrew tradition, rabbinic tradition. And in that tradition, we have Moses here beautifully depicted by Gustave Dure, who, who better to show biblical tales except Cecil B. DeMille, right? So Dure, here's Dure, and here's Moses, furious at his people for worshiping the golden calf while he's up on Mount Sinai. And he's come down with the tablets. He's got the tablets and he's about to break them. The tablets, as I said, are the Decalogue, the you know 10 commandments. They contain every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Huh. But if God just gave Moses writing, how could Moses deal with the Decalogue. How could he write if he couldn't read? He might be able to read without being able to write. Where did these tablets come from? How's writing come to the Jews? So the idea that Moses has gotten the alphabet and writing at the moment that he gets the Decalogue saturates debates and the question of Moses's literacy is a hard one to resolve. Even more, what were the letter forms? Is this Paleo-Hebrew? He sure wasn't using Phoenician, was he? He wasn't a Phoenician. Okay, so the quest to find the oldest and holiest alphabet is driven by this biblical story that Moses is the person who brings writing and it comes directly from yeah, up there. Okay. So, you know, it's the holiest alphabet. It's divine. We must recover it. <laughs> Guess what? The tablets can't be found. Now, this story gets more complicated, as I mentioned a minute earlier, because Josephus, the first century, you know, Jewish Roman historian, whose history of the Jews is really comes to occupy a place, you know, of such authority that people take everything he says as true contains this story, which is not in the Bible. Now, the guy who's dying and doesn't look too good is Adam. And this is Adam's son, Seth, in, you know, time lapse here. And Adam is saying to Seth, you got to go write everything that we have learned on these two pillars, one of brick and one of stone, in case there's a flood, in case there's a fire, and that's your job. But wait a minute, Adam. Isn't he like the first man? Where did he get writing from? What is Seth doing on these pillars? How can there be writing? 
it can't be before Moses gets the alphabet from God. So you see how complicated this gets. Now, this might sound silly, except that these stories are still debated because of the questions of lineages, sources, and belief systems. So that, you know, it's like, how do we identify the earliest letter forms and their source of origin? In addition to text, we have visual transmission. So now I'm going to move through these technologies. There's text, there's story, and now there's visuals. The visuals that really manage a very long lineage of knowledge transmission are exemplars, specimens. Here you see a Greek alphabet represented in the middle of a page of the um, Etymologia from the 8th century. Fine. Greek is around. People know what Greek is. It's being used. It's still, you know, part of living language. So you can extract the alphabet from that. But how about when you have an alphabet that has, or a script, there's only one alphabet, these script forms. But it happens when you have a script form that has no relationship to a living language. It's never used for a text. That's never instantiated in any way, except as a specimen. <clears throat> so here on the left, you see the large image. Here on the right, you see a detail <clears throat> from a 12th century manuscript that's uh, now stored at Oxford and St. John's College. Now, this uh, script here on the right with its names Alamon, Bek, Kata, Katu, this is an alphabet attributed to a figure named Ethicus Ister an eighth cent from an 8th century manuscript called the Cosmographia. Ister traveler goes to the East and he has conversations with St. Jerome and he is authenticated in part by having this script that he brings back from the East. Now, this script is here in this um, manuscript that was made in the British Isles. And it's very specific. Look at it. It shows up in the family and the company, as we say, of runic scripts that are also being transmitted. Now, runic scripts have their own origins and history and so forth. And the great René Deroulet, who inventoried every extant manuscript containing runic scripts, is the source to go to if you're interested in this. But here's this Ister alphabet. And guess what? The Ister alphabet also shows up here in a German manuscript, a manuscript produced in the you know, regions of Germany. Um, in the first half of the 12th century. And you can't see this very well, but here, down here, are the Alamon, the Becca, and so forth. I'll just quickly switch back. Look at that strange winged shape B and these, you know, Qs and, and so forth, Qish looking things. And there they are, right? How does this happen? This is not a script you can take from text. It's a script you have to see and copy in order for it to pass on. And it circulates all over Europe. What are the exemplars? What are the sources, right? How is this possible without a visual? No amount of mine describing to you how to draw the Ethica sister alphabet is going to get an accurate reproduction. You have to have a visual exemplar in front of you. It ends up here in print, again, among um, other runic, uh, uh, among runic alphabets and so forth. So the Ethica sister alphabet is a kind of, you know, interesting example of things that circulated as visuals copied and preserved as specimens. So that's a whole special category of mythic, I call it a mythic script because it's associated with um, Ister, who's a mythic figure. But there are also cosmic and magical alphabets that get transmitted in similar ways, one of which is this celestial alphabet, which you also saw in Mercurius van Helmont. That was the, um, you know, they call them Brillen, uh, Brillen stop. It's like the, they've got these little uh, ring letters and they're ring letters because the ring is actually a star. So here's a 1538 um, you know, study of the heavens. Uh, Postel is a Kabbalist, and Postel's also a serious student, as you see here on the right, of Eastern languages. And he has put together here a 
compendium of 12 um, scripts that are exotic, exotic um, scripts, including Arabic and Samaritan and Syriac and so forth. So here, but the notion that the letters are derived from the stars allows them to really be divine. If this is God's writing, right? It is reflecting the constellations. It is truly the book of nature um, and the letter forms. Now, Postel's work is copied by all kinds of people. You can see here, um, down here from uh, somebody named Gaffarel in 1637, he copies it and the whole chart. Um, in 1533, Agrippa, um, you know, has his version of the um, uh, you know, the, these, um, you know, celestial uh, texts and Agrippa's work is translated into multiple languages and circulates everywhere. And by the time we get to my friend Edmund Fry in 1799, he is copying from Gaffarel, who copied from Postel, and we see those letter forms again. So again, these are copied and passed on. So visual copying. So we have text, story, visual copying. Visual copying is also going to be the source kind of um, technique for some of the compendia makers. Now, compendia are collections of scripts, and they are drawn again as exemplars. What you're looking at here is the top part of a giant broadside, probably the biggest engraving plate they could get hold of in 1616. Put together, it's called the Virga Aurea by James Bonaventure Hepburn, who just happened to be, you know, the librarian at the Vatican. So he had access to all kinds of materials. He puts together this 72, you know, uh, collection of 72 scripts, one for each of the names of God. This has much, you know, sort of Hebrew um, and religious iconography in it. And when you look, at the end of this, mind you, these are all drawn on an engraved plate. They're all copied from some source. You see the celestial script again, right? And the super celestial script. You see the angelic script. You see the script of the angels, which is also called Malachi. You see something called Chaldean. And here, this looks suspiciously like Arabic, right? Palestinian, Canaan. All right, so all of these are culled from materials in the Vatican Library. But the other thing that's interesting to realize is that in the early part of the Renaissance, there was a purge of much of the medieval library materials that looked like they might have anything to do with angels or demons, anything that looked like it was a spell. So sometimes the only record we have of these materials is in these copied um, specimens. So compendia then start to give rise to tables. So compendia are specimens. You see them here collected. And in the work of Athanasius Kircher, Renaissance polymaths, 1669, you can see that the table he has put together has some things you will now start to recognize aside from the you know, Roman letters. We see the celestial letters here. We also see these forms, these Paleo-Hebrew forms again, Where's he getting these from, All right? Turns out there's coins in circulation from which he could have gotten them. And here, all the letter forms are pulled out from their source, identified according to the language with which they are affiliated. And the rhetoric of this table is these are representatives of a type, the type A, the type B, the type C, right? All the way down. These are letter forms in different moments, participating in different scripts, but related to each other, variants of a type. That's a huge intellectual leap. Uh, Mr. Goury, uh, in his you know, Dutch uh, study of biblical history, figures that, yeah, I like that tourist babble thing. I'll just copy it and put it into a nice scene here. I got my shackles, my coins, right? I've got this, you know, muscular worker. I have my erudite figure. All this stuff is just kind of narrativized. Um, oh, I thought I had kept in the, the two uh, side by side. But anyway, he basically just rips off Kircher's table. Okay. So we've seen table, we've seen compendia come into being, we've seen tables come into being. There are many instances of all of these things um, in these periods. 
But then we have a breakthrough. Comes the 18th century. It's not going to be the breakthrough of the 19th century, but we have a breakthrough in the 18th century, which is that the antiquarians are scholars who want physical evidence and they collect it. Bernard de Montfacon writes a giant compendium called um, Antiquité Expliqué, right? Antiquity Explained, multiple volumes. Bernard de Montfacon prefaces his exploration of antiquity, it's the early 18th century, by saying there must be evidence of the Bible, of biblical history. It has to exist, and yet we can't find it. Montfacon is extremely eloquent on the topic of why physical evidence gives you something that text, compendia, lineages of story do not give you. He wants the things in front of him. He is in a position to use his networks and go to every single antiquarian collector he can find, examine what's in their cabinets, draw and reproduce it, and to keep searching for materials from biblical history. At the bottom here, these sad little coins, these little bits of coin are about all that he can find. There are no monuments and there won't be any monuments, right? All we have are some coins. 1728, Edmund Chisel, another important antiquarian, looking at what is the physical evidence, finds these coins. These coins are not that old, right? They're like from the Maccabean period, Roman up, you know, uprising of the Jews against the, the Romans, uh, maybe a little tiny bit earlier, but they are not ancient. They're not ancient enough to really provide evidence of ancient biblical history. And yet from this, um, Chisel can pull out another table to make comparisons between, you know, ancient Hebrew, Phoenician, Latin, and so on, and modern Hebrew and so forth. So this quest for evidence is going to only be answered in the 19th century. The whole 18th century, again, the biblical timeline's intact. There's no significant physical evidence of early alphabet origins. This item, the Eshmanazer sarcophagus, is discovered in 1855 near Sidon, one of the cities on the Levant that gets lumped into Phoenicia. This is an artifact from about the sixth century BCE. It's a basalt sarcophagus and it is carved. It is found by a Frenchman who's on duty there. He's out, you know, he's part of the consulate. He's out, you know, amusing himself and looking for treasures. You know, it's one of those stories. He sees, you know, a kind of hole in the ground. He, you know, sends somebody down and he doesn't find gold. But what he finds is this. It's a tomb. Look at this inscription. Just look at this. This is like so beautiful, so perfectly made, so sophisticatedly elegant in its skill and its competence, that it shows that this is an inscription by someone who is you know, skilled in this. More important, the um, inscription contains a text that has historical references, tells us who Ishmanazar is, how his father, you know, his relationship to his father, cites various historical events, and the language, the strata in which this is found, the location in which it was found, and the text allow it to be dated with precision to this period. Now, the sixth century is not so very, very early. It's not as old as Paleo-Hebrew. This is a well-developed Phoenician script, but the point is, it's the first artifact ever found in the original homeland in which it was made that also has specific historical correlations. Unlike the coins that circulated all over, this is found intact in its original site. So this becomes national, international news. The headlines about the Ashmanazer sarcophagus, debates about it are in European, British, American press all over, maybe further, but certainly in those places. Other artifacts start to be developed and the science of modern archeology span emerges. It's the 19th century. 
right? We no longer are only adherent to a biblical timeline, though attempts to reconcile deep time and biblical time prevail and remain for quite some time. The Ahiram sarcophagus here um, from about 1000 BCE, also, also discovered in that area of the Levant. It's a beautiful inscription on its lid. And again, there's starting to be this kind of sense that stratification, historical cross-reference, script forms, languages, and location can all be used in a kind of modern science of empirical discovery to understand alphabet origins. This is huge. This is really huge, right? By the time we get into the 20th century, we have also a science of epigraphy, the study of inscriptions and um, you know, uh, notations, um, handwriting um, to add to archeology. span So we can find a site. I mean, check this site out, right? Would you notice there was something there that you should pay attention to? This is the gatehouse at Ashish. Here's an ostraca written in 6th century BCE, and you can read the text. The text, again, has specific historical references to it. It tells us about a particular battle, a particular set of circumstances. Look at the writing. This is a really skilled script form. Every detail of every letter in the Corpus Semiticarum has been studied for its orientation, its shape, its length, its breadth, its angle, you name it. Because the corpus is sufficiently small of Semitic inscriptions that every glyph can be studied, um, but it also gives us an indication of when and where and by whom the inscription might have been made. By contrast to the, you know, um, uh, Semitic inscription corpus, which is, you know, several thousand items, the um, cuneiform um, corpus is hundreds of thousands. Like everybody's got cuneiform tablets. There were lots and lots and lots of them um, and they proliferated widely. But what's important to remember, and I'll say this, and then I'm gonna wrap up here in a minute or so. What's important to remember is the alphabet was invented by Semitic nomadic tribes, small communities. They were not particularly stable in their location. And they did not build large, you know, sort of, um, you know, settlements that were permanent. And they did not build monuments. So unlike, for instance, the palace at Nineveh or Asher Banner Pol's library, there isn't going to be a discovery in which it's like, oh, yeah, there's the first temple. First temple was destroyed. It's gone. Right. So there are no major monuments and there were no large inscribed monuments. So the alphabet, you know, emerges as a kind of writing system of, you know, bits of history, bits of, you know, uh, daily business, this, that, the other thing, and only gradually comes to, you know, be part of a, a, a bigger cultural and tribal, a scribal tradition. So the last piece I want to put in place here, I might be one little piece after, but the last piece I really want to put in place here by showing you this magnificent table by Mark Lidsbartsky, one of the main sort of like brilliant pioneers of um, Semitic epigraphy, um, is that tables start to serve a different rhetorical purpose. They don't just say, this is a set of types that relate to each other. You can see how Samaritan, Ar Arabic, Aramaic, et cetera, all relate. Instead, this is a table that is where every glyph in here is linked to a site and an artifact that can be dated. And so it's starting to make an argument about evolution that if we look at the, well, Nabataeans actually later, but if we look at these script forms, we can see how they modify over time and over their geographical distribution. The work involved in doing this and extracting this information and organizing it so that it can be studied. It's really amazing. It does, however, lift the uh, letter forms out of their um, inscriptional substrate. Is it stone? Is it brush? Is it, how big is it? And even its orientation in various instances. So there's a liability to tables because the scale becomes unified. 
As we move into the 20th century, more and more evidence about the alphabet begins to emerge. We have the wonderful William Flanders Petrie, a uh, major figure in Egyptian archaeology, going between Cairo and Jerusalem on some diplomatic mission, stops in the Sinai, a site that has been visited many, many times before by pilgrims and people interested in looking at the inscriptions on the rocks in the valley there and wondering, isn't this the route that the Jews took as they fled, as they left Egypt? Are these, you know, Hebrew inscriptions? And he's staying there and his wife, um, Hilda, sees this, she's, uh, this looks important, you know? It's a, it's a sphinx that has this hymn to Baal on it, inscribed it's around 1800 BCE. It's found here in the Sinai question of where is Mount Sinai, was this the root of the Jews, and so on and so forth, raises many, many questions. But the point is, it's a Semitic inscription. It's not associated with Israel. Israel does not come into being until later. So, but it is a Semitic inscription, and we can see it here. So now we have, you know, a location near turquoise mines where Semitic workers have been brought in to, to labor in the mines. And we see a whole cultural um, exchange again happening between, you know, the, the um, you know, cultures to the north and east and um, Egypt um, along the northern edge of Africa. So this makes sense, right? This, this is really the right place for this to emerge. So you have concept of language and writing, and you have a language group for which this works, and you have a condensed and efficient system. Everything's fine until 1994, when uh, Deborah and John Darnell are hanging out here on the continent of Africa. We're not in the Sinai anymore, people. We're on the continent of Africa, and they find this, the Wadi El Hole inscription. And it's dated to about 1900, 1800 BCE. It's got formal similarities, linguistic similarities with what I had shown you just a second ago, but it's on the continent of Africa. How far were Semites brought in as mercenaries? Who wrote this? Were they illiterate people copying Egyptian hieroglyphics for their own language? Were they bringing Semitic writing systems into Egypt? Many, many questions, which is just to say it's still an exciting field. Lots of material still gets unearthed, but it's small. It's little stuff. I mean, in the sense that it's, you know, a shard here, it's a stone here, and it looks like this. These things are, you know, the Yehemelk, um, uh, Yehemelk inscription from Biblos, is very important in terms of their study. Um, again, systematically examined, and uh, Benjamin Soss, who's an amazing uh, epigrapher, has studied every glyph on every object and put them into spreadsheets to really look at, well, how long, you know, is the hay, to, how long are those strokes? What angle do they have? Is it open or is it closed, right? What, what is that in order to track all of this? So as I finish up, this is pretty much the, the last slide before I make one or two final remarks. One of the things that's interesting here is there's a whole politics to the historiography of the alphabet. And much of the kind of classical um, sort of um, research and scholarship that occurred that emerged in the 20th century tended to erase the Semitic origins. So turning the Greek alphabet into something superior that was the basis of Western culture and civilization um, meant that the Semitic origins in the ancient Near East could be set aside. It's not that important, not that significant. And obviously there's a kind of racial and racist and you know aspect to all of that. But what's remarkable is that the alphabet, which was invented by Semitic speakers in the ancient Near East almost 4,000 years ago, undergirds the internet, alphanumeric notation. Yes, there are also, you know, the numerals and the, the, the numbers and the, and the zero and so forth. But alphanumeric notation is crucial to internet communication and, and uh, digital communication. 
A debate currently rages in the Unicode community. I don't know if it rages, but there's a debate in the in, in the Unicode community. And for those of you a little bit unfamiliar with Unicode, keep in mind it's a you know it's a set of um, sort of positions or places um, for a script form that say how many boxes would I need to represent Cyrillic. How many boxes would I need to represent Hebrew? And these are different, right? They have different numbers of characters. They have different sounds associated with them and different relationship to each other within the total sum of the script. So having a unique identity in Unicode, um, and mind you, the Hebrew letters or the Cyrillic letters that get called by the Unicode code can come from a huge inventory, huge library of different forms. So, you know, if you want to have bold or sans serif or decorative letter, that's part of the library inventory. The point is that the number of categories you need to represent a script is what gives you your identity as a script. So currently there's a debate about whether or not Phoenician and Paleo-Hebrew should be represented by the same Unicode. Are they the same script? In other words, is their actual identity to be collapsed? And that question is, uh, is ongoing. In finishing, the very last thing I want to say about this, and I thank you for your time and your patience, is what's the takeaway here? There's lots of esoteric information in what I've just offered to you. And it's a kind of, you know, just a tip of the iceberg of what's in this book. Because again, it was 40 years of, of work and research to, to identify these traditions of knowledge transmission and, and think about these categories and think about what can a text do? What can an image do? What does epigraphy do and so forth? But it's very esoteric. And for me, there's a deeply personal aspect to all of this, which is that when I first discovered the work of Edmund Fry and then Helmont, and then figures like Isaac Taylor, whose two volume, The Alphabet in 1899 is just an exemplary piece of modern scholarship filled with references to scientific and scholarly journals. The work of David Deringer, Athanasius Kircher, many, many others. I just felt these were my ancestors. These were my forebears. I felt like I had a, a role, a really important job to do to be sure that this lineage of transmissions, this cultural history would not be lost, that these names would at least be registered for future generations to discover, that somebody would care about Tezio and Borogio, Angelo Roca, James Bonaventure Hepburn, and care to see them on their own terms, not as figures who were deluded, who were wrong because of their historical moment, but whose historical explanation of alphabet history was complete in its moment. So that I could, on the one hand, respect the cultural otherness of the past, but also bring forward this tradition for a next generation to be able to find, reference, and explore. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I'm happy to entertain a few questions. And also, I don't want to linger too long on the question because I would like you to be able to look at books and look at books mm -hmm. since Rob was kind enough to draw out a number of absolute treasures. Thomas Astor, Edmund Fry, I mean, these are, these are great, great figures. Yes. So, um, like the, um, it's kind of the plus, plus three letters, and all those other kind of exemplar alphabets that everybody showed and nobody did anything with. What, I mean, why would? Well, there, yeah. <laughs> why? Well, I think it's just, um, you know, it's, uh, it's cultural knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So, to know that, to pass it on. There are a few of those celestial things that are used in spells, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And there's even some third, fourth century um, bowls that um, were found at Nineveh, um, you know, in, in the early excavations that looked like predecessors for those um, alphabet forms. 
So they do have a kind of magical quality. They will sometimes be put into, um, you know, metals and other kind of magic script things, but not not the um, not the exotic alphabets. So I think a sister's alphabet that's never used for anything. Right? It's it's preserved and, and so forth. Runes are used in various ways. Right? So again, each of these things have their each one has its own kind of profile in terms of transmission and use. Um, but yeah, there's not, you cannot find a book written celestial script. Now, you know, since I said that, some little clever person is getting a chat. GPT, do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, Peter Rabbit for, you know, baby capitalists, that'll be you. Um, but yeah, so, um, anyway. So again, it was belief in their, in their potency and their value. Um, as, and also as an explanation of the forms as having a common origin. So those are all pretty big justifications when you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Yes. Any discussion about uh, writing left to right, right to left? Oh yes, definitely. And again, with people like um, Ruth Barsky and others submitted, you know, the paper first, the orientation of the letters is always an aspect of where they were done and what their age is and so forth. So yes, it's it's a crucial feature for dating and for identification, absolutely. Um, and as you know, the Greeks had you know left to right, right to left, and the scriptum that would follow either way. Um, but the Hebrew is largely right to left. Um, so, but not entirely. And there's also in the early days like the body a whole inscription, you notice it kind of follows yeah. up, it rises up, and so there'll be, even be things that are kind of more of a spatial field and not fully organized in a linear way. So again, these are crucial elements for analysis, absolutely. Yeah, it's an important element. Yes? In the, you chose some inventories of different different elements. I wonder what the word scripts, yeah. Scripts, thank you. Um, how did the folks uh, how did you go select which things went into which bin? We didn't believe these things were changing over time, and, and there would be some amount of variation within them. Mm -hmm. How did they select? Sure, sure. How did, how did they select? They all have those sort of designed to get them separate. Yeah, well, again, Litzbarski, his large chart of 1898, he is simply putting them, and he is identifying his sources by place and by artifact. So again, it's very scrupulous scholarship. And then, um, you know, the question of which line A, B, C, D, E, those things belong in is pretty evident, right? And again, part of the principle of epigraphy um, and paleography is that you kind of figure out the ones that you know, and then you start to sort the ones that are dubious. And, you know, so, so sometimes there's questions and there are forms, there are particular letters that have more mutability in terms of where how they look in different locations and others are the more standard. So again, um, uh, Benjamin Sass, who's an incredible epigrapher, uh, has inventoried every known glyph in the Corpus Semiticum, Semiticum. and um, you know it's just it's it's you know but again it's 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 you know thousands of items, not hundreds of thousands, um, and again it's it's precious in terms of trying to sort out exactly where in the Levant and the ancient Near East these different modifications occur. And uh, again, that's a highly specialized and fascinating field of scholarship. So, um, you know, the, again, I can point you to sources that are listed. You know, the, the, and the last thing I'll say, because I think we should break up and look at some of these amazing blogs, um, is that uh, if I were to say what's the canon in alphabet studies of primary works like Frey or Van Helmont or Rappus Morris and so forth, it's probably about 200 items, right? And they copy each other and you can track these lineages and then you see these moments of rupture when, you know, suddenly in the 19th century, nobody is going to cite Gaffer anymore. Nobody is going to cite, you know, uh, so you, you, can, you can see these things really as intellectual, you know, as epistemes really shifting and changing. And again, this is why I really wanted to recover this, because to me, this is not obsolete. It's, it's part of an intellectual legacy. 
um, that I felt needed to be preserved. So, so I'm going to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer other questions. <laughs>